Payrolls? What payrolls? Even though the BLS report was supposed to be the star of the show today, taking center stage to tell us something that we all wanted to know about whether or not the Fed was going to continue to rate hikes and how fast and how long and how high they were going to go, all that kind of stuff. Even though the payroll numbers actually came in really good, somewhat hawkish, people might say, in the real marketplace, it was as if the payrolls never happened. And it started late last night. If you were watching the Japanese government bond market, as I do as a very boring human, I am watching JGB trading at, say, around the 11 o'clock hour Eastern time. Last night, JGB yields started to drop, including the beleaguered tenure, which is targeted by the Bank of Japan, around 50 basis points where it had been the upper end of its range where it had been. Suddenly, there was bids for JGB tenures, but it wasn't just the Japanese government bond market. We also saw heavy bidding during Asian trading, which is why I pay attention to these things, because Asian trading is very important. We saw bids for government bonds the worldwide. It was as if there was a sudden rush of panic. I sent a tweet tongue in cheek at around 11.15 last night as all this stuff started going, as if somebody had leaked a horrible payroll numbers because it was, in the parlance of mainstream financial press, a true flight to safety. Now look at the nut, and it, it continued on into this morning. We'll look at the numbers in a minute, but it, do, it, it wasn't just Asian trading. It lasted through the ebbs and flows of European trading and then right on through the payroll report and into the morning sessions all over the, the entire global bond market. The numbers are pretty staggering, pretty substantial. You look in the U.S. Treasury market, uh, UST 10 year down 19 basis points at one point. It's come back a little bit and it might, you know, as I'm speaking, it might come back, the yields might come back down again. So down 19 basis points in the morning, despite payrolls, you only see a little bit of a blip when the payroll report came out. Again, it's, it's as if the bond market was focused on something else bothering it rather than the good or decent payroll numbers. And over the last two days, the 10 year treasury, treasury yield is down about 28 basis points. The five year down 20 basis points today, down 36 basis points over the last couple days. The two year, the two year is down 18 basis points and down about 37 basis points over the last couple days too. So the middle part of the US Treasury curve in particular saw heavy bidding, which reverses the flow of the last month or so ever since the last payroll report where the market started to sense maybe there will be higher for longer interest rates. No, no, no. Now the market is saying all at once, practically, something else is going on here. And it wasn't just treasuries, as I said. Um, but, you know, treasury yield the six month, one year spread, which is a key indication about inversion, the direction of rates after the peak rate. That one, that one widened out to about 17 basis points. Enormous widening of that spread. And that's a key one. 17 basis points doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot. Uh, Germany, again, it's not just U.S. Treasury. The German 10-year, even though there's a rate hike coming next week, German 10-year yield down 16 basis points today. German 10-year yield isn't even close to the current level of interest rate, ECB interest rates, let alone the next one. Still falling 16 basis points. Since March 6th, the start of this week, Germany's 10 years have fallen 26 basis points. The five-year down 17. Since March 6th, down 28. The 30-year down 15 basis points today when it's not even close to the deposit floor. So global bond market, and just give you one more, I mean, just to throw this out there, Sweden's 10-year down 14 basis points today. As I said, something began in Asia last night, specifically last night, that spooked markets worldwide so that it triggered this flight to safety. Um, and that includes euro dollar futures, euro dollar futures, which are importantly tied to short or short run mar money market rates, three month LIBOR, maybe term SOFR if it actually get to the transfer. But either way, we had massive buying in that, in that same part of the curve as treasuries. The, uh, the inversion has swung all the way back to the June 2023 contract, which means we've got downward sloping shape of the curve after the June 2023 contract. Um, early this morning, the September 23 contract was the price was up 36 basis points. The December was up 42 basis points. The March 2024 contract was up 45 basis. But these are enormous moves. What they tell you was it wasn't just a flight of safety, flight to safety. 
there was a bit of panic here. There was some panic in the marketplace, the global marketplace. Something is going on today. And we're going to talk about what it is that might be going on, including one thing that you won't hear any, anywhere else, but Eurodollar University fans and Eurodollar University scholars probably already know what that is. But first, I'm going to do my little spiel about Eurodollar University. I'm going to thank you for joining me because I truly do appreciate it. And if you are interested in understanding the monetary mechanics and all of the stuff behind these things that we talk about on the show, we've got Eurodollar University memberships. We've got Eurodollar University research subscriptions, a daily briefing, a deep dive analysis, all the stuff that's got you covered for all of these things that we talk about and hardly anyone else does. Hardly anyone else knows what's going on, money, finance, and economy. And if you don't know the monetary system, you're left listening to Jay Powell, which is a horrible place to actually be. So if you're interested in a membership, research subscription, whatever the case may be, eurodollar.university. So we've got falling yields, we've got rapidly expanding inversion. So before we get to explanations about what those inversions mean or what, what's the panic going on in the marketplace, let's back up and review a little bit. What did those inversions mean? Now, technically speaking, or literally speaking, inversions simply mean the market expects interest rates to go down in the future or to be lower in the future than they are today. And it's not meant to be taken literally in that respect. It's not like the market, Euro dollar futures, for example, are saying that interest rates are going to be exactly 2% lower two years from now than they are today. It's about probabilities. When you see an inverted curve and a heavily inverted curve, what that means is the probability that the direction of interest rates in the future are going to go down is exceptionally high. And it's incumbent upon us, therefore, to figure out what it is. And in the interest of doing that, I'm going to read you something I wrote in early December. Therefore, to get from aggressive policy action response to consumer prices that have yet to convincingly display a sustained downward tendency into what these inverted curves strongly imply would be an equally aggressive policy action in the opposite direction, rate cuts. It's not at all likely to be due to some minor nuisance. There's obviously something big here because there would have to be something big. As it stands right now, especially today with some good payroll numbers, Jay Powell's inclination is going to be even more hawkish, or at least as hawkish as he was last month. And that everything that we've heard from the Fed, everything we heard from the Fed mouthpieces, is that nothing has changed in that regard. And there's certainly no payroll report numbers here that are going to change the FOMC's mind. So how is it that rates are going down? Already low longer term rates are going even lower in rapid fashion despite this next payroll number. Let's, go, let's continue with what I wrote in December. If that means recession, which more and more appears probable, if not already, a modest rise in unemployment wouldn't be enough to trigger full on Fed reversal. From the sky is falling inflation to the sky is falling in unemployment is in 2001's moderate dot com cycle. So how then to get there? How do we get what the yield curve and the Euro dollar futures curve and the German bond curve and the Canadian curve, all these curves are saying that we're going to go from aggressive rate hike, rate hike, inflation fighting central banks to aggressive rate cut, oh my God, central banks. How do we get from there to here? And what is it that markets are pricing? One more time from December. The other piece of yield curve inversion isn't strictly economic. Decompose the yield, the yield into constituent parts as Irving Fisher did such a long time ago, and you end up with growth and inflation expectations. When those are declining from short to long term, it tells you something important, fundamental about growth and inflation potential from the market perspective which as I say here, you'd be wise to heed closely instead of listening to Jay Powell. An unhealthy dose of deflationary monetary conditions would aggressively lower growth and inflation while also triggering lower policy rates. Let me say it again. An unhealthy dose of deflationary monetary conditions. So it was always two parts in the yield curve inversion. The one part was nasty recession, which by the way, more and more looks to be the case, despite the payroll reports in the United States. And the other part was something wrong, something goes very wrong in the monetary system, 
which actually isn't something new, which is not something we, that the market is just worrying about right now. What the marketplace is telling you today is that something that was bothering people enough to hedge so that curves were inverted is bothering them a lot more today than it was in the past. So what was it? What is it that's, that's triggering a near panic flight to safety across the entire global marketplace? And as I said before, longtime Eurodollar University viewers, Eurodollar University scholars probably already have an inkling about one, an observation about what happens during these periods in the calendar. Because if you look at your calendar today, you'll note that the date is, well, I better check. It's March 10th. March 10th is very nearly the middle of March. And what we see repeatedly throughout monetary history, especially the last 15 years of monetary history, are these very defined seasonal low points in the liquidity calendar, liquidity system. One of those happens to be the middle of March, because if you recall, go back 15 years, the little firm by the name of Bear Stearns, when did Bear Stearns actually fail? Well, it was a Friday afternoon, which just so happened to be March 14th, the last trading day in the first half of March. Suddenly, Bear Stearns was out of money because it wasn't just Bear Stearns. The global dollar shortage, which was erupting and becoming acute, became even more acute as the system moved toward this seasonal bottleneck. That wasn't the only one. Um, when did Lehman Brothers fail? Lehman Brothers failed at the opposite seasonal bottleneck, which is in the middle of September. Again, a Friday, Friday, September 12th. And the, the actual insolvency and Federal Reserve stepping in or not stepping in, they kind of did, debating stepping in, that was announced on Monday, September 15th, which then triggered AIG downgrades and a liquidity run and a collateral run on AIG. When? September 15th. 2008 seasonal bottlenecks march september two weeks right in the middle of the calendar month two weeks before the end of each quarter there's more examples when did we have the last major global crisis that was triggered by pandemic fears but the the worst parts of the march 2020 crisis were right smack in the middle around Again, a Friday and a Monday, Monday, March 16th, as well as Friday, what would that be? The 13th, middle of March of 2020. More examples. How about September 2019? Remember repo? That whole repo thing that still to this day isn't really explained, not that people haven't tried, not the Fed hasn't tried, but a low seasonal bottleneck that had nothing to do with bank reserves in the TGA account. When did that happen? The repo rate first erupted on September 16th, and it stayed high on the 17th and the 18th for good measure, spilling over. Again, seasonal low point, bottleneck. One more, one more relevant example to the situation that we find ourselves in. It's one that I've been talking about, especially recently, September of 2022. If you look at some of the deeper monetary indications, look at SOFR, look at the T-bill rates, look at uh, the three-month Japanese government bond yield. When did those start to tip down? Before you had heard anything about the UK or the British pound crisis, those came on September 20th and 21st, and really the low point in September 27th, we saw SOFR, T-bill rates, and some other indications, J-bills and whatnot, those started going lower on September 15th. So we have these liquidity bottlenecks that are dotting every calendar, March and September in particular, but also year-end in December, and occasionally in June, though not nearly as much, but March and September. What did those mean? These seasonal bottlenecks, these low points in liquidity are all about money dealers having various balance sheet constraints related to quarter end procedures. We don't need to get into those today. I'll, I'll probably go and revisit those at some point in the future. But what you need to know is that these are there every year, every quarter. There's this March, every half year, there's this March and September bottleneck. And not every one of them shows up in the financial media or in these markets going haywire, panic across the world. 
Only those when dealers are ultra constrained, when they're especially constrained, when money is tight because dealers are not doing their money dealing activity, that's when we notice these seasonal low points. Like March of 2008 and September of 2008 and March of 2020 and maybe March of 2023. Now, I don't want to make too much out of it, but what I think we're, we're witnessing here is that and a special, you know, again, the March of 2023 looks a lot more like more of the troubled bottleneck periods than the more benign ones, which are which are pretty much standard and typical throughout most years. So that tells you that there is already constraints, there's already monetary tightness. But what does that have to do with what's going on right now? What are some specific explanations that we can maybe identify for it? Um, some of those in the mainstream you hear, um, SVB is a particular one, Silicon Valley Bank, which is undergoing what looks to be like a bank run. And that's because there is a few things going on. And I just talked about this in a recent video when I went over what's going on with primary credit in the discount window. Small banks in particular have seen their cash cushions dwindle way down. You've also heard about Credit Suisse. Uh, Credit Suisse has experienced its own funding difficulties, but like Silicon Valley Bank, I think those are being uh, mixed up together in what is overall, which is more of a systemic issue here. As I said, in the marketplace, let just today, this wasn't just a U.S. thing. This was a global way, a global flight to safety, a global flight to collateral, maybe. Um, some people have questioned banks in particular they're hiding losses because the fed has hiked rates and fixed income prices have come way down they're not marked to market losses therefore maybe all these banks are sitting on huge piles of losses that nobody knows about and that's possible but you think about most of the banks have been stacking u.s treasuries for years and even as those u.s treasuries have fallen in value all the bank has to do is wait to maturity and cash it in at the face value so there's no there's no hidden losses in treasuries even if the mark the market price is currently down they're trading at a heavy discount to where they were when they issued again the bank is following the rules and doing the right thing if they put it in their bank book rather than in their trading book they don't need to mark to market because all they have to do is hold them to maturity and get paid off in principle. The risk of loss there is actually quite low. In fact, it's practically zero. And that's true in a lot of mortgage-backed securities too. That mortgage-backed securities have lost a lot of current market value. So a bank probably puts that in the trading book or in the, in the bank book from the trading book. If it's in the trading book, they put it in the bank book, hold it to maturity, that's it. There's no losses there. So I don't think that's the issue here. I think the answer is what we talked about in September. It's why we highlighted the Swiss National Bank and its dollar swaps, because as I said in another recent video, I think the damage was already done last year in the same way it had been done in 2007 and heading into 2008. If you think about it, the monetary crisis that became the global monetary crisis of 2008 started out relatively small. We saw a jump in LIBOR way back in August 9th of 2007. And then we had a bunch of stuff happen. And for a period of time, almost six months, more than six months, it seemed as if that was kind of it. If you weren't paying close attention to the markets, which most people don't, most people can't, they don't have the time to do so. They're not going to be up at 11 o'clock at night watching JGB trading. But back then, if you hadn't seen what was going on in the marketplace, you saw some stuff happen in August. The Fed responded with some rate cuts and then some more rate cuts. And then, then there was some funky TAF options and dollar swaps in December. But in between, it kind of seemed like that was it. It seemed like the whole system was doing just fine. And even the economy, which had slowed down, appeared to be holding up in early 2008 as if everything was fine too. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, bam, Bear Stearns. But it wasn't out of nowhere. It wasn't that way at all. The, the marketplace erupted into chaos in August of 2007, and then under the surface, back in the shadows, it was experiencing continued monetary deflation. The very monetary deflation that inverted yield curves has, had warned about all for a couple years leading up to it. 
So we've had heavily inverted yield curves for a very long time. And there's two parts of those inversion, uh, yield curve inversions, as I said, the first part being macroeconomic uncertainty, which is becoming less uncertain by the day, as well as the possibility, the, the way too high potential for a deflationary money outbreak. And these low seasonal points, March and September, have the nasty habit of revealing when the liquidity, when the operational capacity of the money dealers in the system is at its most constrained, which raises the level of danger in any situation where dealers, financial participants, even economic agents are going to become highly risk averse because of circumstances. That's maybe what happened this today, last night and today wasn't just about Silicon Valley Bank, nor is it really just about the March bottleneck. It's much broader than that. And I think it links us back to what we saw last fall in September and October, passing the point of no return. An incredibly fragile deflationary monetary system, which markets are telling us the potential for something nasty is way, way too high. Thus, massive moves in euro dollar futures hedging and bonds around the world a little bit of panic today not in stocks of course i'm jeff this is euro dollar university thank you very much for joining me as always a huge thank you to all the euro dollar university members as well as the research subscriptions research subscribers who are buying subscriptions and until next time please do take care